Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you, Global Patties. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support, and we know you'd rather we get right to talking about beekeeping. However, our great sponsors are critical to help making all of this happen. From the transcripts, the hosting fees, the software, the hardware, the microphones, the subscriptions, the recorders, they enable each episode. So with that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. We're really happy you're here. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to subscribe or follow Beekeeping Today podcast and give us a five-star rating. It really does help. Also, we are now adding complete transcripts of each episode on the website after the show notes. Check them out. You can also leave questions and comments online under each show. You can leave a comment, ask a question, reply to a question, ours or our listeners. Click on leave a comment at the top of the episode's show notes to join the discussion. Have you listened to an episode and thought, that person sounds really interesting? and I'd like to know more about them. Well, now you can. Each episode links to a guest profile. Each profile has a guest photo, bio, contact information, including Instagram and Twitter details if they have them. Check it out. And finally, share the podcast with your beekeeping friends, email them links, or mention it at your next beekeeper meeting. Hey, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. Today, we have two USDA ARS researchers to talk about their recently published paper on the differences between winter bees and summer bees' preferences to food tainted by the pesticide emitted to cloprid. We also briefly discussed their paper comparing the efficiency of the standard wooden Langstroth hive to newer polyurethane hives. Both of these papers are topical for today's beekeepers. Now that fall is here, honey is harvested, and most of us are buttoning up our colonies for the winter, what is a beekeeper to do with all that newfound time? <laughs> there are lots you can do. Get caught up in all your reading. Gather up your beekeeping magazines and journals. Maybe that book you impulsively bought and haven't opened? Maybe you are a woodworker and you can set up for making next year's equipment. Of course, if you're like me, you could finally get after all of those household repairs and chores you put off during the summer. I suggest you consider one more activity. Check out your local bee club. Maybe even join it. If you are already a member of a club, attend a meeting or two. A local beekeeping organization is a wonderful resource for beekeepers, regardless of your experience. And how is this so? If you're a new beekeeper, you will meet other new beekeepers who have the exact same questions you have on what you saw and experienced this past season. They are facing winter with the same concerns. At the meeting, you'll be able to ask your questions and receive an answer or two from more experienced beekeepers. And this is important from experienced beekeepers in your local area. If you haven't heard it before, all beekeeping is local. As you read that book or watch that YouTube video and listen to that beekeeper, look at their surroundings. Do they live where you do? Are they located in the Midwest and you're located in the Northeast? Are they in Florida and you in Oregon? Yes, you are both keeping bees in boxes. But the environment is different, the timing is different, and the small variances in management needs make a big difference on whether or not your bees survive the change of seasons or are strong enough to produce a surplus honey crop. I believe that a local beekeeper who's kept their bees through multiple seasons is a more valuable resource to you as a beekeeper 
than any book or YouTube video. If you are an experienced beekeeper who hasn't joined a club or joined one but doesn't attend meetings, break out of your stasis and give back to other beekeepers. If you've been keeping bees for years and years and have a wealth of experience that can help newer beekeepers, do so. Share it. I know not every bee club works for every beekeeper. Check to see if there's another bee club nearby. Or you may consider joining the state beekeeping organization. There is a bee club that will be good fit for you. Oh, and one last benefit of a bee club. When it comes time to move that bee yard, you will know who you can call to help. Just be ready to lend a hand when they call you. Okay, let's get on with our talk with Dr. Mohamed Abaraki and Miguel Corona about their research on the effects of the neonic imidacloprid on winter versus summer bees. But first, a quick word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Hey, beekeepers. Many times during the year, honeybees encounter scarcity of floral sources. As good beekeepers, we feed our bees artificial diets of protein and carbohydrates to keep them going during those stressful times. What is missing, though, are key components. The good microbes necessary for a bee to digest the food and convert it into metabolic energy. Only Super DFM Honeybee by strong microbials can provide the necessary microbes to optimally convert the artificial diet into energy necessary for improving longevity, reproduction, immunity, and much more. Super DFM Honeybee is an all-natural probiotic supplement for your honeybees. Find it at strongmicrobials.com or at fine bee supply stores everywhere. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, the regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now are two of the USDA ARS honeybee bee researchers from Beltsville, Maryland. We have with us Dr. Mohamed Albaraki and Dr. Miguel Corona. And they are both just completed a couple of papers that we found really interesting and wanted to bring it to your attention. The first one was the effects of the imidacloprid on the seasonal phenotypes of honeybees. So just how does that affect honeybees in the summer and in the winter? And the second paper that we'd like to talk about is the polyurethane hives versus the wooden hives and in insulation through the winter. So after that brief introduction to very important papers, welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I spent a fair amount of time studying the paper that you did and what you call winter bees and summer bees, and you found some significant differences. And basically, can one or both of you kind of sort of sort out the difference between what you are calling a summer bee and a winter bee? Because I think beekeepers have a feel for summer bees and winter bees, but I want to make sure that they understand what you were using as a definition for these two. So hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having us. And it's really nice to be with you and the audience too, and beekeepers, to really facilitate and simplify what we are doing in terms of research. Because research usually tend to be complicated. And, you know, us as beekeepers, we say, okay, those are big papers, big work, but what is in it for us, you know, in terms of day-to-day -day beekeeper? So basically, we know, I mean, as beekeepers, we know that we've got summer bees and winter bees. That's not new. I mean, those are two different seasonal phenotype of bees. But we don't know. Usually what we tend to do is we, we tend to experiment on the summer bees. You know, I mean, when the season is spring, summer, we go, we bring bees from the field. We Because they, they are out there. You know, you see them day to day. They forage. They come here, there. But we rarely conduct experiments on winter bees, that case, because winter bees, they are clustering, they are in the, in the hive. And we tend to really ignore them a little bit more than, than summer bees. All, all our focus is really on, on, on the summer bees. And within the summer bees, we know that we've got what we call the nurses and the foragers. So this is also like a different classification in terms of task, what they do in, in terms of task. So are they all the same? Yeah, they are all bees eventually, but summer bees are different than winter bees because of many different physiological aspects 
as well as as other stuff that we can talk about later on. But also foragers are different than nurses. They are different in the task they do, and they are different in the longevity, how much they can survive. And this is also different from one species to another. So you've got variation. And when we study any effect on, on bees, we tend to generalize, oh, this stuff is killing our bees. But it's killing what? What is more susceptible to this stressor that we are studying? Could the winter bees be more susceptible or the summer bees or the foragers or the nurses? So here we've shed more light on, on this type of aspect vis-a-vis -vis the amidocloprid. And as we know, amidocloprid is highly toxic neonicotinoid used like widely on cropping and many other trees and orchards. So that was the, the basically the how we approached that question and this experiment. So what you're telling me is that winter bees are bees that are born when bees aren't foraging. I might even say winter, just when bees aren't foraging. So their experiences and exposures are going to be different than bees that are born in the summer and are either nurses and are being exposed to outside influences when foragers come back or they're born as foragers and they're directly influenced. So you've got winter bees who are basically virgins in a whole lot of ways and summer bees that are exposed to the real world pretty much. Am I close? Yes, the nature of their job is different which will give them different probability of exposure to stressors. So that is to summarize. Yes, you're right, Kim. You also use another term in the paper, and you call it naive bees. And these are bees that, once they emerge from their cell as adults, they don't have an opportunity to interact with other adult bees in the hive. Is that correct? The bees, when they're born in the colony, they are exposed to, to other adult bees. And one important thing that we start to understand is the transfer of bacteria with the microbiota. This in the last year has been very important. Almost every aspect that we know about honeybee biology is affected by the microbiota, including, including this ethical pesticide. So this is why we have the idea to, to, to test this effect. So uh, then most of the, of the studies previously done were conducted using bees, with them naive, because they emerged in the lab. They are not exposed to other adult bees and they lack the microbiota. They have alterated microbiota. Now we know these bees actually are more sensitive to many stressors. So one of the contribution of the work that we did was just show that how the microbiota is affecting the, the resistant to, to pesticide. And it turned out that microbiota actually helped a lot the bees to resist these stressors. Are you calling the microbiotics? Is there any a predominant micro? Yeah, yeah. There is a, this bacteria has been studied and there is several uh, genera of bacteria, for example, lactobacillus that are predominant. And uh, very much like a human, it's very much the same, the same thing. The term you've asked, you've inquired about, like naive, I added it by purpose, in fact. <laughs> it's used in our field, but, but here it gives you the idea of those bees are so naive that they don't know what they are doing. So they just emerged, they are unexperienced. Basically, it's really to say they are unexperienced. Why they are unexperienced? Because of their age. So they are very young couple day old, and that's the first thing. And the second thing, they have not been exposed to older mates in the hive, you know, so which, which is to say, okay, they came to the workforce and they've never taken any training or any webinar to know what they are supposed to do. That is the exact meaning of naive, you know, in that context. The behaviors that they exhibit once they've emerged are going to be not influenced by any diet that they've received from other worker bees, any experiences they've had either with other bees in or out of the hive, or actually they're just walking around kind of trying to figure out what to do without any help. Correct. And that is what we did in terms of one of the category that we've tested is those bees that we called in, in the paper, bees emerged 
in the lab. I guess that was the term used. So the category of bees emerged in the lab are those naive bees. They've never been in the in the colony or in the hive. They've never been taught by older mates. Okay, yeah, what are you doing over there? Come here, clean here, do this, learn about this. They've never been in communication with more experienced bees. So how they would behave if we give them a choice? That was one idea. And then how bees emerged inside of the hive with which were exposed to older mates, how they would behave under the same circumstances. And the third category was winter bees. Winter bees are very experienced bees because they are much older. They have a much more developed microbiota compared to the other two categories. And then we run the experiment and then we were looking, seeing how, what choice they would make every one of these categories and how the pesticide would alter their behavior as well as their toxicity or mortality or how also they would exhibit preference to a specific diet offered because we because this experiment was a dual choice so we offered them two choices and then we let them we let we observe which one they would prefer and which one is killing them more and which one is affecting them more so all of the bees that were in this, and there were, I want to say, I think the number was 2,700 bees in 27 different cages. You gave each of these cages two choices of diet. The bees were free to choose whichever one they want. And what you were looking at is the difference between these three categories of bees on the choices that they made. Am I close? Correct. What were you feeding them? So basically, the, the feeding, you know, we've got different type of feed. The, the feeding, usually it's called aclibitium. Aclibitium is when you offer them something and they are free to, to pick and eat as much as they want. They're content, you know. Other type of experiment, you can subject them, usually when it's toxicity experiment, you subject them to a specific dose. You give them like 200 microliter of this dose and that's it. So you starve them, you give them 200 microliter, and then you keep them with this 200 or 20 microliter. 200 is too much, in fact, 20 microliter. And then you observe to see the toxicity and how much it's affected. That's not the, the case in our case. In our case, we give them sugar syrup control, one choice, clean one, the one like the one we give when we feed them in the wintertime, you know, one to one saccharose sugar syrup, one kilogram to one uh, liter water. And then the other one was the same saccharose the same sugar syrup, but it was tinted with two different concentration of amidacloprid, 5 ppb and 20 ppb. My choice is then, if I'm one of these bees, I can have pure sugar syrup. I can choose sugar syrup with five parts per billion imidacloprid, or I can choose sugar syrup with 20 parts per billion imidacloprid. And what you were looking at were... Basically, as, I'm, as I understand it, trying to measure which choice each of these different kinds of bees made on a fairly routine basis. Yes, but they, have, they didn't have a choice between the 5 and 20, in fact. What they had a choice, one category was they had, they had a choice between 5 PPB and a clean syrup control. And another, another cage had a choice between 20 PPB and a control. And then a third cage had a choice between two same controls, you see? So they are the same one to be able to compare. In a real world situation, which of these two treatments, the five or the 20 parts per billion imidacloprid, would be somewhat realistic in terms of a bee foraging on a flower that had been sprayed? Do you have a feel for that? Yes. In fact, those, the 5, 20, and the 100, usually we use a lot, these three different concentrations. Now, I need to clarify first that the, the LD50, the, the half-lethal dose of amidacloprid for honeybees is 13 ppb. So basically, the 5 is sublethal concentration, if you want. The 20 is a lethal concentration because it's more than those 13 PPB of LD50 for bees. So basically what we've used is we've used a sublethal concentration 
like which is like kind of it should not kill them badly <laughs> let's put it that way and then at 20 which should be lethal i mean they you should they should die if they if they drink properly and they accumulate a lethal dose so and usually also in other experiments we've used the highly lethal dose over lethal dose which is the 100 ppb okay so that is that is the distribution of the concentration we've used in that experiment I've got a feel for what kind of bees we're talking about and what you're offering them to make choices with that bees that have no experience, bees that had lots of experience, and which one did they choose? The naive bees that had no experience with other bees at all compared to the bees that were very old and had been around a long time, was there a big difference, some difference, no difference? So, in fact, we've seen a huge difference in their behavior as well as in their preference and how they stick to their preference, you know, as well as the effect of the pesticide on their survival. So that's the major finding of this work is that the three different categories, Kim, that you've just mentioned, in fact, they showed complete difference in their preference. So, and why this is important, because in the summertime, we want to make sure that when our bees are exposed to neonics outside of the hive, which one will die first? Are the young bees, the naive bees, let's call them, are going to die first or the one foraging in the field a little bit older, a couple, couple uh, weeks old, you know? When they bring these pesticide and chemicals within the pollen or within contaminated with, with their nectar or, what, or, or on their bodies, and they store it inside of the colony, they are going to eat it in the winter time. If uh, the concentration of pesticide is accumulating in the winter time and bees are feeding on this stored food, then the winter bees will be susceptible to collapse due to chronic toxicity, you know, throughout time. So this is basically what, what we are testing here, because if the winter bees, for example, are rejecting the tinted or let's say the the food that is contaminated with amidocloprid, then they will have higher chance of survival because they will not like it. They will not consume it. They will feel that it is tinted or it is contaminated with this toxic molecule. You know what? I'm not going to eat it. I'm, eat, I'm going to eat from a different cell, whether it's pollen or whether, whether it's honey. So that, that is, that is the, the idea here is that or they would say, you know what? I like it. It smells like, I don't know, or like mint or strawberries, or I like this flavor. And they start eating from that flavor. And then they accumulate a huge amount and they prefer it over the clean syrup or the clean pollen or the clean nectar. And then they get toxicity because of this high consumption and because of the preference they've, they've shown. And they've picked because they des- they like it. They des- they desire that flavor. So yeah, this is this is the major thing that will have ramification. In fact, on on their preference will have ramification on their survival and toxicity. There's a lot to unpack in what Muhammad just said. Let's take that opportunity to hear from one of our sponsors. Hey, podcast listeners! Here's what we've been waiting for all year long. It's time to harvest and extract the honey. When you're ready to bottle and sell your crop, head over to BetterBee.com. There you can shop for custom honey labels and glass or plastic honey containers. As your partners in Better Beekeeping, Better Bee does all the work of figuring out the weight each honey container will hold, not just the standard water weight or volume measure. So you can choose from the classics or go bold and different with a great selection of uniquely designed bottles. Check out our 50-plus container options and order with confidence at BetterBee.com. Let me ask you this. You have some bees out there that have not been exposed to any other bees in their very short lifetime. And as a result, they really have no level of microbiota in their gut and their intestines. Did you find that bees that had an ample supply of microbiota compared to those that had none, was there a difference in survival when even between the two treatments, let alone the two different kinds of bees? 
So what we found to make it very simple, flat, like straight to the point, is that we can't say bees without microbiota. That's almost impossible. You always have a you always have a slight level of microbiota inoculation when the bees are emerging, but they will improve the level of their microbiota gradually by trophallaxy with other bees and by eating pollen, by eating nectar. So the they will increase the boost the, the level of the microbiota. But here, in that case, if in, in, in our case here, the summer bees emerged in lab with weak, we suspect that they have a weak microbiota, very undeveloped microbiota. Guess what they do? In fact, what they did is they've been avoiding the amidocloprid all the way along, like from five PPB to 20 in both choice. We give them the choice. They were running like crazy to just the syrup, the clean syrup. So they were avoiding the amidocloprid. For why? I mean, why is doing that? Why they were doing that? Even, even when we challenged them with a rotation, I mean, the rotation is very important because at the middle of the experiment, after nine days, if I remember well, what we did is we've, we've switched the position of the, the two syringes to trick them, to see if they are really just attached to the local physical location of the syrup or they really like the taste of it. You know, you need to uncouple these two factors. So what they did is, no, they don't care about the, the location of the syrup. They want the taste of it because they were changing changing side and going back, fo- like following the, the source they liked. In the case of bees emerged in the lab without microbiota, what they were doing, in fact, in fact, they were following all along the, the clean syrup. They were rejecting the amidocloprid. Just one thing to try to explain a little bit the effect of the why uh, this happened, the avoid. What we think and have been uh, shown uh, more or less in some studies is about the function of the microbiota. Microbiota is providing essential components in the nutrition, like uh, amino acid and fatty acids. These have one direct effect on the immune system and detoxification system. So when there is no microbiota or it's not right, the composition, the immune system and the detoxification system is weak. So they make more susceptible to the, to the bees. Maybe this is why they avoid the sugar with the immunoglobin. Good term. Interesting. Uh, it's encouraging to some level because you've got bees out there that are, I don't know if I should say smart enough not to eat this stuff, or their experience says this other stuff is better. However the choice is made, I'm glad that at least some of them are making it. Now, the, the Kim, if, if I may jump here a little bit quickly, what you said is very interesting. We, we don't know, in fact, but, but it has been studied in, in, in other insects. Are those uh, bees smarter or they, they are, like Miguel said, they have a microbiota that is not developed enough, then it is not letting them survive better and detoxificate the, the product. Or, but the choice, in my opinion, is more behavioral. So there is something called post-aversion response in insects, and it was studied on, on other type of insects, and it's also on bee, in bees. Is that, you know, when you eat something, let's go, okay, you, you get some, uh, I don't know, Coca-Cola or whatever, any drink. And then each time you take that drink, you feel bad in your stomach and, you know, God, ah, I don't feel well. Then next time you go to the shop, you know what? I experienced that drink. It was making my stomach problem, my stomach. So I'm going to, I'm going to buy something else, you know? So what they did is, is in, in other insects, it, it was studied. They, they try the syrup. And then they have a malaise, what we call a malaise, like some, I don't feel good. And then sometimes they can push the syrup out or they will form a s- slight experience and memory about the smell of the syrup that gave them previously some trouble, you know, and they will avoid it. And of course, they, ha- they don't have a long term memory. They have short term memory, which they can keep for some time. So we don't know exactly what's going on here. I think we need to study more that. But you, but you know, bees, they have extremely powerful sense of smell with their olfactive receptors. So they are very, very sensitive to slight difference in smell. And our study showed 
in fact, that they can distinguish between 5 ppb of amidocloprid. This is very low. We're talking about five parts per billion, you know, of amidocloprid. If they can sense this amount, that tiny amount, this is just amazing, you know, which is evidenced in our in our study. One of the things, as I was reading through this, that I was wondering about is you've got these winter bees who have been around a long time, and their preference seemed to be headed almost exclusively towards the solutions that had the imidacloprid in them. My question in the back of my head that I didn't get answered was maybe that's all they know that's food. It tastes like this because that's all they've ever experienced. Could this have been... The clean stuff, the good stuff over here didn't taste good because I've eaten my whole life the stuff that has it in it all the time. Is that a possibility? So the winter bees, which is really interesting, in fact, because they were sticking no matter what to the amidocloprid. Like even you, we changed the syrup, we left the clean syrup straight ahead like crazy to the amidocloprid at both concentrations, you know, 20 and 5 ppb. So they like it, you know, I don't know what, I mean, but they like it. And yeah, and I think Miguel has a reason. Different, has maybe a, I have a different idea you have, maybe. Yeah, we, it's, well, well. it's different than mine, I guess, because we had this discussion. <laughs> you, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you, it's interesting, in fact, this idea. Go ahead, Miguel. The thing is, I, I am a physiologist, since a physiologist. So everything I saw under this point of view. So for me, the, you know, the, the bees avoid the, the immunical pit because they don't have the enzymes to the toxification to break this toxin. And the same happened with the winter bees. Winter bees, they have the microbiota already, and they have mechanisms to extend life, life span, like the queen. They, in some way, they are kind of similar to the queen. No, both queen and winter bees have different molecules that are similar, like more vitelogenin. Vitelogenin is a dull protein. It's like a good cholesterol for human. You know, it's a good indicator, indicator of the health. So winter bees and queen have high levels of vitelogenin. That is good. It's one antioxidant. I think this has been a selection for a long life, extension of life in winter bees. And be resistant to different kinds of stressor is one of these characteristics. So this is my point of view. I agree, Miguel, but I want to tell Jeff and Kim something very amazing. I don't know if you guys were able to spot it from the paper, but despite drinking more amidocloprid and liking it, like McDonald's, we like it. <laughs> <laughs> so despite that, they survived better than the other bees, which avoided the amidocloprid. So, so the theory of Miguel is I really endorse this theory because they have a more robust detoxification a detoxification machinery apparently where they can decompose and metabolize this product in a much more efficient way compared to the summer bees whether they are hatched in the lab with weak microbiota or whether they are hatched in hive with relatively fair developed microbiota now, now my theory, my personal theory, <laughs> I know Miguel may not fully agree, but that's fine. <laughs> Winter bees, they've been around for a while, guys. Like, why? Because if we assume that they are the last set of brood produced by a hive, which is the case, everybody agrees, I think, on that. They are the last set of, you know, of, of brood produced in the late summertime. So they are out. They had the ability to go a little bit out, forage. They've been doing their task here and there. And they've been exposed to amidocloprid. And they've developed a strong microbiota. You know? And they have different level of vitalogenin and major royal jelly protein and the physiological genes that we call. They are ready. They are full of fat. And they are ready to winter. Like the polar bear, you know, bears. Oh, they eat a lot and they, okay, hibernation, guys. So those are the same thing. So having said that, now they, they have all these characteristics and then they've been exposed definitively in the field. Neonics are everywhere. They've been, we've been spraying neonics for the last 20 years. So no matter what you do, they will be around. They are in coated seed 
crops. They are spread three times on six times, up to six times in cotton, soybean everywhere. So they've been exposed to that. And why they choose to have to eat, to drink from the amidocloprid is because they've been already familiarized with this taste. You know, they've seen it before. It's like, like, okay, I give you a drink. Oh, you know, I, I had this drink in Italy or I had this drink in France or somewhere, you know. I remember that. I mean, I'm fam- I'm very familiar with it. So it's exactly, in my opinion, this is this is the case. And since they are able to distinguish that little tiny amount in a one-to-one sugar syrup, which is five ppb, imagine like five ppb is nothing, guys. Like if you have one billion dot, you are adding five dots only of amidocloprid. So it's nothing. So they are extremely sensitive. So they are picking it. And they said, okay, you know, uh, I like this one. It's different in taste. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drink from it. Uh, now, we still have stuff to dig here because, because as I said, what is, what is really amazing is that they've drunk more of tinted amidocloprid at both concentration, and they survive better than <laughs> both other two categories, you know? So we still have a lot of stuff to explain here and to see what's going on here, in fact. We have a very good lead here in our work. And I want to add something very important. We tend not to discuss it, which is the control. The control, sometimes, you know, you can say, oh, you know, it was random or, you know, I don't know what happened. They preferred this side better than the other side. Maybe you guys were wrong. So what we did in, in every single experiment is we give them those two controls. Remember at the beginning of the the talk, I spoke about two controls. So we give them these two controls. And each time those two controls, they were consuming randomly the same amount. So which means that there is no doubt whatsoever that there is an effect on their preference and on their choice in every single experiment that we've conducted, whether for each of the three categories and for each of the two different concentration of amidocloprid. Jeff, we'll have a link to this paper on the webpage so people can delve into this. If I may, I want to kind of sum this up in one sentence from this. It seems that the longer you live, the chances are you're going to live even longer, as opposed to you start out young and you get introduced to this stuff, you're going to not be around much longer. So I'll leave it at that. I want to bring up one quick thing very briefly that we'll also have on the webpage is that you were looking at insulated hives for wintering. And since we're both kind of talking about winter bees here, I thought I'd bring that up. That was an interesting study that you did on that one also. Can you tell us just briefly a little bit about it so people can go get it? We want to compare typical colonies, wood colonies, with the polyurethane colonies. Recently, we were interested in the effect of winter, how the the cold and and humidity is affecting these colonies. And yeah, I mean, it was uh, assumed that polyurethane were more better in in keeping the temperature, better temperature. And we did a a study in which we actually verified that uh, with very precise measurement of the temperature and the humidity with some sensors. Basically, the idea was to improve beekeeping. You know, we are losing a lot of our colonies in the wintertime. I think the average was last year catastrophe. Like it was 50%. I was in a conference in Georgia last week. I've, I've heard like it's 50%. Like we are losing half of our hives just for winter mortality in the U.S. So how we can help? Well, we've tested those synthetic hives that some um, vendors are, are selling, uh, the polyurethane hives. We said, okay, maybe they can provide better insulation in the winter time, and if if you if you provide just a tiny little bit better insulation, you might save bees from starving. For example, if they run out of of storage of uh, syrup in in the winter, so maybe maybe couple days would make a big difference if they have like a, at least in our area here they have some sunny days where they can go out and forage a little bit sustain themselves just for the early spring. So it, it might make a big difference. So we tested a set of polyurethane hives versus wooden hives. And we've put sensors inside of temperature and humidity. And we've monitored the weight. No, in that study, we didn't monitor the weight. We're monitoring the weight in, a, in an ongoing study current. But basically, we, we tested that and we've we've shown 
so far in the winter time, the polyurethane hides are providing a better insulation than the wooden Lingestroth classic hive that everybody is using. So that was really, and, and they are providing also a better, a more optimal level of humidity. That was done only in the winter time, guys. So we started the experiment, I think, in November, and then we ended it in maybe February or something like that. I don't recall exactly. So in the winter time, on 20 colonies, we tested 10 by 10, 10 polyurethane, 10 uh, wooden Langestroth classic stuff, and we had better insulation with the polyurethane colonies. Now, it's a matter of preference, too. You know, some people, they will tell you, you know, I don't like those polyurethane. I, I prefer my classic wooden stuff. So you've got also the commercialization, the preference of the beekeeper. The, but for our, our target was really to see if they can insulate better because the, the, the insulation level of this material is really more efficient than the wood. I mean, that just makes perfect sense. And now you've got numbers to prove it. So that's the first good step. Jeff, we'll have that paper on the web page. Is that correct? We'll have links to both those papers. Yeah. Well, guys, what did we miss here that's important that beekeepers know that might give them a leg up on how to deal with pesticides in the real world? You know, I studied pesticide a lot. And I studied pesticide in, in France. I studied pesticide in Canada, in the U.S., in Tennessee, in uh, Mississippi, in especially not all pesticide. You know, pesticide is a big word. For us as beekeepers, we should be really concerned about the neonicotinoids and particularly those, yeah, just the neonics. Because herbicide and other type of, of, of pesticide, are they are not very toxic to bees. I mean, they are toxic for other insects, and, and, but for bees, it's really just the neonics. They are extremely toxic to bees. And that's why we run our study on, on amidacloprid. So your question, Kim, is, is huge. It's a huge debate, you know, the question of pesticide, the question of pesticide everywhere, everywhere. What we need to do is we, we run a very interesting uh, ex experiment in Tennessee to test how, to, to really show how pesticides is affecting bees and the landscape where you put your bees, whether you put them in a area with a lot of crops or whether you go in the jungle, you put them in a forest area or I, we've tested that. We've published a lot on, on that topic, but no matter what you do, bees, they need to eat something. They need to eat from outside. They need to eat from the pollen. They need to eat from flowers. They, they need that. And then also at the same time, farmers, they need to treat their crops. So it's a survival matter. I mean, both parties has to work together. Both parties have to work, work together to find a consensus and the common ground where a farmer will thrive and have uh, farmers will have thrive and have their pest management control program running and beekeepers can also have their bees foraging in a safe environment so this is the bottom line in my opinion that's a good bottom line i think the right phrase there is working together it's something we all need to do be better at to make this work for everybody anything else jeff no, I think I am on full. This is a lot of great information, and I look forward to hearing more from Mohammed and Miguel in future papers. Thanks a lot, guys. Well, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. I have a headache after listening to that. There is a lot of detail in their research. You said you read the paper, what, 11 times or so, and I'm going to have to go back and get caught up to you because <laughs> I, I still can't say amid a clue. Imidacloprid, yes. The research paper itself was eleven or was twenty pages long, and for a research paper, there's a lot of graphs and charts, but the charts are very informative, and you can get ninety five percent of what you need to know off the charts without having to read all of the statistics and the design of the research. But what they showed was, you know, one of the things that beekeepers can take away from this is were there bees exposed to imidacloprid earlier in the season so that they've developed some, I'll use the word carefully, immunity to this stuff so that when they go into winter and they're eating this stuff because that's all they've got to eat, they're going to survive as opposed to those newbies that haven't any experience eating in imidacloprid, eat it once or twice and die. You know, you throw that into the mix with mites and viruses and everything else and you've got a problem. I'm not sure what beekeepers can do to change their management style to make that happen, but at least they've got it in the toolbox. 
Well, knowledge is key, right? And so if you at least are aware of what your challenges are, you can at least make even minor changes to management practices. And as they say in some of the sports, you know, marginal gains, they add up and can make a difference. I encourage people to get the paper. The link, I know, is going to be on the webpage, and I guess there was there might be some issues with getting the uh, paper about the insulated hive, but the one on pesticides is going to be there. Download it, read it, and look at the pictures, and, and you'll get a good feel for the work that these guys did. It's really pretty and phenomenal. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at globalpatties.com. Thanks to Strong Microbials for their support of this podcast. Check out their probiotic line at strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for their longtime support. Check out all their great beekeeping supplies at betterbee.com. Thanks to Northern Bee Books for their support of Bee Books Old New with Kim Flodham. Check out all of their books at northernbeebooks.co.uk. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on the show. Feel free to leave us comments and questions at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.